speaking, and I am Felicia Turner Walker, and the mother of my mom leader today, my daughter, who is a child who is 11 years old and had a stomach. She didn't take me home. She told me she didn't need my help. She said, Well, she didn't have to go. We are very excited for this family to cultivate a personal perspective and a professional role. Well, we will have several candidates who will be there. So, bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> We have several panelists who will share some of their reflections behind the why of what they do and the importance of getting communicated with people, people who live in the Sorry. Um, in our work, first you will hear from Ida Winters and her songs and her sons, Rashawn and Veron. Veron, sorry. Um, then you will hear from Brittany Prince and Dr. Jessica Simichek and Dr. Laura Sloan and Lunaya Alexander. We, we will open the floor questions to the audience for all of our for all or any of our panelists. I would like to turn it over to Ida, Rashawn, and Veron. Thank you. Um, so I'm Ida here with, with John and Veron. Um, so um, I work with um, Wiseman Center and Wisconsin. <laughs> Thanks, you want to see that there? <laughs> Um, and um, Naya's mom and Felicia um, come on together for parents of children on the spectrum and other special health care needs. I'm also a parent of three young men, these are two to three, they all have genetic conditions. Ironically, all three different genetic conditions. Um, I've been doing family navigation with official title for four or five years, but I didn't realize that I had been doing family navigation for my own family for almost 18 years because um, we're trying to for three days to be 18. So, you know, it started with my family and carried on. And like in my community, I have a um, nickname as in Google because <laughs> I have all of the information. <laughs> so, and you know it's an important thing. Um, like during the conference in North Carolina, I gotta say you guys brought it. Um, the family navigation and how important it is, and we're like sitting at the table talking to Kita and Felicia, and we're talking about our experience and how important the family navigation is and was with our experience and getting our children diagnosed and assessment and things like that. And how the struggle was, and how you know it doesn't cost us or take anything away from us to do the navigation for another family to help and make sure that they get through the system with their child when it is that they need, that they need to support them. Hi everyone, my name is Renaya Alexander and I have, I'm a sibling of children with neurodiverse disabilities. It's kind of mixed emotions. Like at first, I was overwhelmed because I didn't understand why my siblings were always spinning or they were always super loud and couldn't sit down. And then 30 minutes later, they were so quiet and didn't want to be touched. But when my um, sister got, what is it called? Therapy, um, evaluated, I was listening and hearing the, the questions and how she was finding it. And I understood uh, how all my siblings reacted all the same way in different situations. And I became an advocate for my little brother when at first we didn't know we had autism. And so I would record him in between situations where I felt as if he was doing the same stuff as my other siblings. And that caused my mom to get him evaluated and we soon found out that he had autism as well. So 
I don't know. All my siblings, I love them. They're super intelligent. And it helps me have more patience and be a better communicator and be in tune with my emotions as well. And it helped me help my mom with her business and support other children with their trauma experience. So I am glad to be a sibling of kids with autism. Okay, I'm um, Rishan Lutri, and I'm a sibling of someone with autism. And basically, it has helped me navigate with other while working with other children with autism or developmental disabilities while working at summer camps because at summer camps, a lot of people don't know how to deal with those kind of children, and then sometimes they just assume that they're just acting out or they're bad, but Sometimes it can be a different underlying problem. And also, whenever they find out that someone has autism, they usually like tell me so then I can work closer to them because I kind of understand from having to support my younger brother with day to day things from like just reminding him to do stuff or different kinds of stuff like that. And yeah. <laughs> My name is Farah. I just actually have autism. Um, I wasn't diagnosed or evaluated for autism until I was like close to turning 14. So all my life in school, like, I think I was just, I got in trouble a lot because they just thought I wasn't listening or. I wasn't doing what I was telling them what I was supposed to do. So I got in trouble. I wasn't getting the support I needed up until I got evaluated, which I already still wasn't in the school when I wanted to come in. But now I'm getting more support. I'm starting to support out of you when I need to get better support. Thank you all so much for sharing your different perspectives and your experiences. I know we will have a time, time at the end for Q and A with our panelists. So we can think about during the office and questions that we want to ask. I like to turn it over to now, now to Brittany. Hi, Brittany. I'm from Ohio. I live in Ocali. Um, I am the oldest sibling of Jacob. Uh, Jacob's 24. He is also on the spectrum. Um, I am one three. So if my sister Kristen was here today, we might have totally two different fields to get right now, but I'm going to speak on mine. So my brother was born when I was 11 and he was diagnosed when I was probably 13, 14 years old. This was like late 90s, early 2000s. So when we were sharing with our family and neighbors and when my friends would come over for sleepovers, like the reaction was always, oh, like Rain Man? Like that's what everyone thought my brother was going to be like. And as he grew up, he definitely was not. So that was something um, I always was just like shocked by that they already had this idea of what my brother was supposed to be like to them because of this thing they saw in the movie. Um, but my brother has never, to this day, has never needed to speak to me for me to understand him. It's almost like this weird sixth sense. I don't know if you guys ever feel this. Um, I have this very strong connection to Jacob, and I don't know what he's thinking, but I always know what he's, why he's doing what he's doing. And I understood that as a young teen, um, and it built a very strong connection and relationship between us at a young age. And that made me turn into like this advocate, this interpreter, this middleman for Jacob, this protector. Um, so when anyone was frustrated or thought maybe he was, quote, being annoying or being uncompliant, I was there to like explain, no, actually he's doing this because of like, And I actually did that a lot for my parents. So I didn't know the terms per se. I didn't know the interventions, but I knew him. Um, and that stayed with me throughout my whole life. So 
being a sibling and my career path definitely intertwined at a very young age. I always thought I wanted to be a teacher. And then when I learned more about the services that my brother experienced, I thought I was going to uh, get into speech therapy. And at the time, I was working at a daycare. And a woman came into the toddler room, and I asked what she did. And she said, oh, I'm a developmental specialist. I'm an early intervention. She told me her, her role. And I said, oh, my God, like, that's what my family needed. My, my brother had early intervention, but he got on the bus and went to the center 45 minutes away. And we would get things in his backpack. And my mom would like try so hard to do these things. And when they didn't work, we would just give up because we didn't know what to do. And I knew that's what I was meant to be here for and how to help people. And a big part of myself as a professional is to make sure that families don't have to go through what my family has gone through, if that makes sense. So not only for parents, but for the child. I don't want this child to feel like no one understands them, can't connect with them, doesn't support their uniqueness and embrace that. But I also don't want parents to feel frustrated or don't understand or doesn't know what autism is or gets on the wait list 10 years too late and they're waiting for this waiver or whatever it is because no one told them about it. So as we grew up, my mom got older um, and so her health declined. So I went through guardianship with my mom and we became, I, I took on that family navigator role as well. When I got my first job at a DD board, um, I learned about so many other services my brother was eligible for that nobody told us. So my brother went from the age of three to 13 without any service coordination. So not until I got that very first position was I able to tell my mom, you know, do this, go here. Um, I got her, helped her get connected to an SSA and we were able to open a lot more doors. So that's something I still think about a lot with the work I still do, even though I'm not providing direct services to families. Um, how can we help make this lifelong impact past the age of three? So that is a big part of who I am. But a lot of times as a sibling, um, you guys might hear this too, that like, wow, you must be so brave, you're so strong, or, and I don't do it because I think I'm the best, or I, I you know, you do it because you're their, their sister, and you love them, and you know that's the right thing to do, um, and I don't, I want to be included in these conversations because you know what's best, um, and you want to fight for it, and there's a lot that are still left to fight for, so, I think it's very important not only to include autistic voices, but people with lived experiences, because that is going to be where the change comes from. We can be a professional and we can know the research and we can know the best practices and we can care so much about this field. But I think when you live it, it's different. Um, and everyone's nodding their head. And I've met so many other people that could also be up here with us. So it's just a guard comes down when you are next to someone. You're like, oh yeah, my, my son is on the spectrum or my brother, or my, you know, oh, okay. So it's just so important to involve those conversations. Thank you for the meeting. Next we're going to hear from Dr. Jessica Finnegan. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me here today and inviting me to speak as part of this panel. Um, I'm Jessica, and it's really great to hear from the other panelists so far. Thank you all for being here. I'm at the University of Minnesota. Um, I'll kind of go chronologically, and I'll promise not to ramble too much. This is a little way to, to stay on track here. Um, but uh, I had a family that was doing a lot of special education and profession, a lot of educators in my family. That, that's how I kind of got from my professional path. Um, my PhD is in special education and educational psychology from the U of M. Um, I have about probably 15 or so years and counting um, when I entered that program in providing early intervention to children with autism related or developmental disabilities at home. Um, schools and center-based uh, locations, so something that was really important to me. Um, and uh, yeah, I decided to kind of pivot and be a little bit more focused in research. So I currently direct our Tel Outreach Center at the University of Minnesota, our Institute of Community Integration, um, and really involved in our lending program, which is really important to me too. Um, and some other great projects, and enjoy working with my team from Minnesota here. 
um, and all of that was kind of happening. A PhD, uh, I was writing my dissertation when I was pregnant with my son, Bella, my middle child. Um, and he was diagnosed with autism. He was just about to turn two. And um, that was a really interesting experience as a professional in the field for a long time because he was doing some things and not doing other things. And one of my main focus areas is children on wait lists um, and studies and how to do some supplemental support. And so the last thing I wanted to do was take a spot, you know, on a wait list that we didn't need. So I consulted with people I was lucky to know who were like just, you know, refer him. And, and that was an important part of the journey. But when I'm, you know, trying to make a son and I'm, my job is not to diagnose him or decide if he does or does not have autism. It was to get him people who could, who could um, evaluate him and who I trust and, and, and then kind of take the next steps from there. So that's what we did. Um, and when he was diagnosed, I was also seven months pregnant with our youngest daughter, Pilot, um, which the way the universe kind of works. One of my other focus areas of research is supporting families who have. Infant siblings were at an elevated likelihood of developing autism. And I had just a really surreal experience to sit there and be like, I'm not one of these families. Um, and, and I'm sure we had a you know a much easier path than many other families did, but it was really challenging. Sat on wait lists. Um, and how I kind of used some of that information, um, that that period of time is so stressful. And um, how I've used some of that information going forward has been to think about. So much of my job here on your mention has been supporting a child, and that's of course what we're all here to do. That family really needs um, support too. Sorry. Okay. 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 Thank you, Jessica. Yeah. The final thing is for you to share her lived experience with Dr. Warsaw dealing with the laboratory for. Thank you so much. Um, well, my name is Dr. Laura Sorg, and I am a family physician for the past 16 years. Um, I began born and raised in southwestern Ohio. I'm a farmer's doctor, so you'll hear me talk about that in a little bit. And my claim to fame that we were going to talk about was as the Ohio Beef Queen at the State Fair of 1999. So, so again, I, the flavors a lot of my discussion just growing up in rural Ohio and what my worldview was as a farmer's daughter and a bit of air, um, where many of us might have, you know, again, had people we went to school with, you know, I first was um, ever introduced to the world of intellectual development facilities when I was a classroom assistant, when I was a whole grader. You know, they, I think that somebody probably said, gosh, you know, you've got that sixth sense or you care about people. Um, let's have you go over and help kids in gym class. It was so much fun, right? Um, and, and not knowing that it was ever going to flavor my life later on as a mom of a now, um, again, my kid just turned 12, you know, and so I was going to say 11 year old, um, uh, you know, a little boy, and he's not so little anymore, um, who is on the spectrum named Jake. Um, and so, again, throughout my career, you know, in medical school, et cetera, I was always interested in the field of development of facilities, really interested in the world of rural medicine. Thought I was going to go back home, probably County, Ohio, is really close. There are like two doctors, maybe one doctor to people in Robert County, that I was going to do mission will be on the top shop. Um, and so life happens, and there's a lot of things that I think have happened in my life that have been very serendipitous for her, my role, you know, view, like you'll hear me say it's a tough thing. Um, and so throughout, you know, time, um, had my oldest son who's going to be 15 this summer, a few year, years later, I'm pregnant with my son, Jake, and, um, you know, again, I was asked to, a few months after he was born, would consider practicing closer to home because um, Dr. Mary Appleby, who is now the Ohio Department of the Suite, Prior to her and Medicaid medical director was um, stepping down for her role in family practice. Um, and so it, it met peace. And so they were like, hey, you want to come practice? Sure, that's awesome. You know, so I got this little four month old, a three year old, and I decided to completely put the script and change my practice Um, Again, never know with knowing that I get those on the spectrum. About that time, they know this Jake was just different, right? Um, and if anybody's had children, you know, and like the kids, Kids are different right, from one another. Siblings are different, and totally different from my brothers. I mean, we're one of the family, being a family doctor. One of my brothers is a semi-truck truck driver, right? And the other one's a partner. So I'm the weird 
the encounter as well as women patients. And so here at the Soul Forum and Home, I know this is not doing great content for the breastfeeding. His breastfeeding sessions are really short. Um, as he's trying to learn to crawl, he's kind of going funky and not really, you know, kind of like his mobility is different and going, oh, he'll be okay. Oh, he'll be okay. Oh, he'll be okay. And about age 15, 18 months, I started literally put two and two together. He's actually pretty vocal, you know, again, and um, he starts looking at five months and he would just sit at church in a circle, square, square, a rectangle, triangle, like looking at all the stained glass windows. Um, and so um, it was easy enough. I was actually a patient at my practice before I was a doctor in here. So I look at my partner, who's our, you know, our doctor, and I'm like, he's a kind of great too. Let's do an M chat, do the M chat. Oh, we only failed by one. We'll wait and see, right? Should we, you know, how many people have heard we'll wait and see or, you know, again. And I've said it once in my life, I think about that every time we see that kid. I always have a 12 year old. Um, and so, not my child, very really. And so, long story short, I get involved in early intervention. Um, and really, the rest is history. Um, I'm really fortunate, and I and I mentioned this to Brittany as we were discussing earlier. Um, I'm really fortunate that as a doc, I have a different worldview and a point of privilege that I now realize exists. And I really wish that everybody had that same thing. And that's something that drives me in my own structure because not everybody has the same worldview as me. Um, and that the long the longer that I become a physician, um, within a physician, the more it drives me insane. It's just not fair. Um, and so one of my things is for people to know what I know and for medical students and residents to know what you all know, right? You know, again, for them to have a perspective um, that way. So long story short, I put my kiddo in a million different therapies. I always tease he's going to need therapy for going to so many therapies. Um, you know, again, and to the point that I was teasing Brittany last year, he said, Mom, can we not do OT and social work with some please? <laughs> you know, and so we started to make that choice in voice. And that part's been hard for me as a mom to try to figure out parenting the preteen adolescent part of him with also allowing him to have choice in voice. From the sibling part of things, um, trying to not get on my 14, almost 15 year old every time he corrects him or is big bothering him, because his point and this makes me want to cry is my almost 15 year old said, You want me to treat him normal. This is what I would treat any other sibling if I had another sibling, right? And so I've had to allow a little bit of that to happen. Um, it's hard because I want to have that protector role. I want to, like, again, buffer him, I want to buffer him from the bullies at school, all those different things. Um, and so that's one of my proudest moments this past year is my kiddo comes home and says, um, I'm gonna remember student council. Dude, that's cool. I'm gonna remember my office. Okay, what office? Like I'm gonna remember pleasant. Okay, right. You're gonna start freaking out and getting ready to do the crap of like when you move this, all the things. He's doing a speech in front of the whole school, he nails it and wins. Wow. <laughs> It's not like I really, you know, goes through it, wrote it, I mean, that kind of thing. And um, so I'm so proud of that. But I also, you know, realized that a lot of that is him. And a lot of that is putting him through, I can say that, so many of the EI things, the teams he's worked with, you know, again, knowing the road, knowing the road map, and wanting so badly for people to know that road map. So fast forward to doing that instructor, right? I wish there would be like some like great, like, that life where it's in my life's dream. No, Dr. Mary Hathaway, Director of Medicaid, calls me during the pandemic and says, hey, you want to help with your baby with some people that need help. I'm really worried about this, folks, in COVID, right? We know the disparities for individuals with um, fragile health needs. Sure, I thought it was going to be on a committee. And so um, Director Jack Davis calls, who then Director is retired, and said, um, by the way, do you want, like, I'm going to, like, let's meet some people. You're going to meet some people. I think you're going to really like them to help them out. I logged into a job interview, guys. Like, I had no clue who was interviewing for a job. Like, I logged in, and when they asked me to be medical director, I got off the phone, I started crying, and I said, well, my husband, I have to do this. And he looks at like, me like I'm nuts. Like, our family practice, and then it's mixed family med, and kids, it's a big practice. And we have 11,000 patients that are this with all the docs. And a lot of them, a, a chunk of them are neurodiverse. So like Mary's kids, this is what I always say about my drop of these kids, that she has to go 23 years, but you know, 24 years, people that had, um, that others did not believe in are now more as adults. And so um, the first thing I said to Jeff was, I said, if you tell me that I can't still see my patients, 
that have developmental disabilities, I have to take them out because that's I'm defeating the purpose. Or, you know, again, with things. Um, and then my husband said I was nuts because he's worked for state government for 17 years and he looked at me like, saying, why do you want to do this? Um, but I had to. And I'm so thankful. So I've been a natural director for three years. Um, it's not without challenges. I'm trying to do both things part time and also navigate the room with the dad of stage for my And I mentioned that because I'm farmer stuff, right? So my dad has seven farms. I can't believe he's thinking that. Um, so land rich, money poor, right? Um, at one point in time, 30 bucks in the night account, can't make this stuff up. And I mentioned this because I also realized that my dad is very diverse, right? Um, memorizes every part number ever on a tractor, and I'm going, okay, my dad's probably on the spectrum. How do I help my 70 year old dad who has cancer navigate? And I'm coming from that point of privilege. So I oftentimes look at my dad and go, Dad, hold on, I gotta talk to doctor, and then I'll talk to doctor to whoever the level profession he is. It's really great for me, Dad. It's really great for people that know me and I can advocate for. It's not fair. And so that I just mention all of this because the little girl from, you know, again, the farmer girl of Ohio that grew up down the way from those two back because we went to neighboring high schools and didn't know it. Um, again, still have a lot of that little girl from Southwest Ohio, but trying to make sure that the people in rural America, the folks in inner cities, and the folks that don't look like me, don't speak the same language as me, that are the grandpa that came first generation from the journey of the boat can get the same advocacy and care. So sorry for my rambling. I got in a tune in the morning, but thank you. Yep. Thank you to all of our panelists for sharing your experiences and journeys. And thank you for such an insightful and amazing job. How can we engage people with American friends and other allies open the floor up to questions from the audience? And I'm gonna be repeating the question into the webcam so we can get a chance to try. So if you see me sitting on the floor, that's why. <laughs> So I have a question for Ivan and Veron. Um, I just wondered what, if you don't mind sharing with us, um, because you had such a late diagnosis, or you know, you were so much older than my expected diagnosed. Could you talk to us about what led you down the road? So we have a question for um, Ida and Veron about um, what led them down the road to get a late diagnosis. Oh, um, I always notice something's different before I first I thought something's wrong, but I discovered something's different. Mm -hmm. Um he was advanced in everything, so you know, nothing was wrong with his being. But um it's just he's number three out of the kids, and you know you're watching everything. You counted ten fingers, ten toes, but I counted twelve fingers and ten toes. Yeah, really. <laughs> um, but you know, things like that, and then school, it was always an issue, things like that. And we were trying to get diagnosed, he got diagnosed with the to get suited, but none of it fit. They gave him medication and basically tranquilized him. So, you know, we went through this for years. Um, we tried for our IEPs six months, every six months, we evaluate. That I, it's not hindering his learning. So he didn't qualify for IEP until he was facing expulsion. Um, there was a project that was started um, with UW Madison, Wiseman Center, Marquette University, and South America. And I wound up working for the project. And I was actually in training on the fight that I was in spring for autism. And when I'm being trained, I just burst into tears because of like all of this again. And so it was kind of like I had to work in the system in order to get him an evaluation and diagnosis. So he got his diagnosis two days before his 14th birthday. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, I, I, thank you for sharing. And I'd really love to know a little bit more about once you got the diagnosis. What what did that what did that mean? What did that mean in a school setting? What did that mean for you? Just how did you process through that? And then how does it look now that you're now that you're on the other side? And also was were you going in? Were you in eighth grade or ninth grade? I'm trying to. I was in eighth. Was that ninth grade? I was in eighth grade. Okay. Okay. Yeah, tell, tell us a little bit more about it. I'm just curious. So, um, well, when I went back to school after the third grade, it was basically the same as the rest of the I didn't change it. I saw you in the rest of the work, and it was the same. So we we got the diagnosis COVID time. So. He was at home and nothing changed. But, like, once you're over the age of eight, really there's no support services available unless you're already in fear. So, really, there was nothing that changed. Instead, they couldn't just say it was a bad decision that he made. Instead, they had to be like, oh, well, he has autism, so we'll look at it a little differently. <laughs> But when he went back to school, so like when he was younger, you know, autism, I started looking up and looking at things. And I told him, because, you know, they would say he was weird. He thought he knew everything because he took things very literally. And I tell him, I said, your brain just processes things differently than others. And, you know, he thought about it and he took it literally. He explained that to people at school. They still thought he, thought he knew everything, but... He took that and he didn't feel bad about being a dog. So when he got the diagnosis, he kind of worked with it, but he looked up autism and educated himself about it. So he was able to work better with it and express himself in school to the people he needed for support. Like he has a support team in school and he has a plan where certain things take place. He's able to go and talk to this person and they can sort things out. Thank you. So thank you to each of you for talking with us today. And this is my question is for the siblings. Um, have you found that you need to explain what autism is to your friends or to, to neighbors? Or how do you answer questions others may have? Um, sometimes I find myself having to explain like what autism is and like more so of the aspect of them thinking in a different manner than you know other people because a lot of people don't understand that part of it. Um, so it happens quite often, you know, where you have to explain it and then you have to, you know, also explain that not all people are the same and they have autism. It's a wide spectrum because people tend to generalize them all into like one category or they all have the same symptoms or something. It's, that's completely not true. Mm -hmm. I would say the same thing you said, but yeah, we do. I do have to explain it a lot to my friends, and because they always ask, her, "Why are you always doing this, or why is she always doing that?" It's because she has autism, so the way she be acting and do some of the stuff, certain stuff, I have to always explain to them. Oh, she don't like when that happens, or he don't like when that happens. So yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. I, I agree. I, and then I feel like a lot of times there's a lot of follow-up questions that's like, then they become curious and then they want to, they want to know more. What does this mean? Can they do this? Um, what about this? You know, so then it becomes a little of an info session, not just about my brother, but just about autism in general. For all of the siblings, was there ever a time where you felt like you needed support? And when you need support, where did you get it? So we have a question for the siblings asking um, if they ever felt that they needed some support, and if so, where did they get it? 
Um, yes, but when I do, I always ask my mom because I know that she has more knowledge to awesome than I do. So I always go to my mom for questions on how I can better support my sibling. Um, yeah, I tend to ask my mom because she's more knowledgeable about it, but it's more so when I'm working with other people with autism that's like not just my sibling, like when I'm at summer camp or something. And then, or when I have a feeling that like, you know, somebody that hasn't been diagnosed, but, you know, have a feeling that they might have it, I like kind of ask her and then like explain it to her since she has the past history of like doing the screenings. And then I'm like, Oh, maybe that makes a little more sense. And then also I asked her, like with younger children, how can I best like work with them and like help other people learn how to work with them too? I think it depends on the type of support I need. So a lot of times if it's I'm feeling like guilt or worry. I will definitely talk to my mom because she has a lot of the same worries. Definitely my husband and my closest friends, they all know what's going on in Jay's life. If it is I am to the point of like exhaustion, like caregiver fatigue, I will call my sister like, hey, sorry. I know you aren't really involved in this, but girl, you gotta be involved in it right now. <laughs> um, so it, it really just depends on what I need in the moment. But yeah, I would say quite often I do need that support. Uh, questions for all the young people here, including the moderator. Um, what are your dreams and uh, like a dream job or something if, if your uh, life experience has kind of that? All right, we have a question for um, all the young people about what are their dreams? Uh, what do they uh, hope to do with their life? Um, I don't have a dream job, but it is to be successful, and I would say that I'm doing good right now because I am being put into better situations and better environments to better support my future. So I say yes. <laughs> um, I'm thinking about pursuing a career in neuroscience because I always found like the way the brain process things very interesting and like every person processes it differently. So I was thinking about neuroscience and psychology because I find it all very interesting. I want to pursue a career in studying psychology. My opinion is to be so we go my mom's business. <laughs> 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 so, being a choreographer because I like to dance a lot. Everywhere I go, I just dance. She or she knows. <laughs> I have a question for Jennifer and Laura in terms of, um, you know, this early diagnosis. Um, can you talk about how the people are very interested in support services, family members? Can you talk about what were the most helpful things at that time, sort of leading to the where you need to go? Do we Oh, sure. Go ahead. Um, so the question is again for Jessica and myself regarding again the early diagnosis regarding support. It's like what was the most effective or best support or best thing that we found to help along that journey? Um, so I mentioned my partner who you know was our doctor because I, you know, I was a patient of the practice before you know I was a doctor there. Um, and so again, serendipitously or a god moment, um, my Jake was the first kiddo through Union County, Ohio, ADA. Not because he was on the first that got ahead on the list, it was a radio program, and he happened to be the first referral from early intervention for ADA. Um, and so that was a great moment for myself and my business partner. Um, because he looked at me and he's like, I don't know if I can do this. And I said to him, 
you can do this for Jake, you can do this for any kid, like again, to be, you know, again, the aid at this shit. And if the team can do this for a doctor's kid, quote unquote, then they, you know, do pretty good. We did a follow up, um, you know, we're on the waiting list. So it was like nine months later at Nationwide Children's Hospital. We knew what the diagnosis was, but the team said, if you're willing to, we would like to have the confirmation and compare the ADAP profiles, you know, for the, you know compare the, again, the assessments. Um, so that ADAP was huge for us because it allowed us to access services a lot earlier. Um, and then I think, honestly, the other thing was probably um, speech and social skills groups. Um, yeah, so I figured it's a speech, and, and I always say that um, to my kids, you know, I call my practice kids my kids, right? So I see zero through 97 as my always patient. Um, so I always say that all of my kids have ever heard of speech. I was in speech from second to sixth grade, first to sixth grade. So, um, you know, again, to me, speech is part of life, right? And, um, but speech was really difficult for Jake. Um, he still has a thing with people that, um, Women who are dark hair or with brown eyes are again very intimidating to him for some reason. And um, that was his first speech pathologist. So he would call her Dora the Explorer because she just that was a good book. Um, and so he, um, it, you know, but it, it, I don't want to say forced in that sense, but, but, you know, again, it helped him to realize like, okay, I can get through this. And also he started to uh, never forget his label emotions. And so he, you know, the first time was when he was touring his uh, preschool um, and he said, I feel happy. And that was huge. Um, and so again, I think, you know, from a, an OT and speech standpoint, and then for him, and then as a mom, it was totally ate up. Can you say what that is? Uda? Oh, sure. I'm gonna mess up. I'm awesome. no, okay, I'm gonna mess it up. Thank you. Diagnostic education product or project. I always mess it up. Like again, so um, the thought is is that from the diagnostic standpoint, does how many states have ADA or you know what ADA is? Okay, I know a couple of them we talked to. So the thought is, is that you train, you know, the trainers train others, if you will. You've got these amazing EI teams that are already out there as built-in logistic teams. And then if you can work with a community-based partner. Um, and you're often a pediatrician in the end or psychologist, then you've got people with amazing sets of skills. You can go ahead and get those diagnostics done early. Um, and as we were discussing the whole of Minnesota, um, we were discussing a little bit about like overwhelming centers, right? You know, we've got like three big academic-based centers with a year to 18 month wait list. Um, you know, again, if you've got People that are knowledgeable, they can go ahead and do, you know, again, the, the assessment and makes a huge difference. And so that was really interesting as a mom, as a physician mom, as a psychologist mom, to, to watch that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So for Colin, my son, uh, he did start early intervention, um, early ABA when he was pretty young. Um, I think we had, you know, pretty short wait compared to most people who were able to get him in three or four months. So that was huge, you know, so I just really wanted to get him going as soon as possible. And they were very family-centered and, you know, um, were able to go at our pace. And then that was, yeah, that was kind of the biggest thing for him. And then as we got, you know, because COVID hit in the middle of all that, and then we got through that and did um, a preschool, just just a community preschool who was willing to have a therapist go in and work on some social things at the preschool. Uh, and that was a really good fit for him. Um, that was great. And then for my youngest pilot, because I was worried he was going to get like lost in the shuffle of all this stuff. Um, we did, we rolled her in a study that as part of that study, she would have an annual um, evaluation for autism. And I feel like that gave me some peace of mind. So she kind of like had a spot there if we needed it. And I could kind of turn off that part of my brain and just be mom and not be trying to watch, um, you know, for anything that I need to act on. And then I think the third is we just have this, just by, you know, you know, um, university had just happened to have this wonderful pediatrician and she shared with me when who was diagnosed that she, her son had autism and just like that connection, even though okay, most of my professional life is autism, um, some reason really meaningful. Um, I do be patient, but it does go a long way. It's keep it in mind.
Okay, so my question is for um, the sibling as well as moms and for our um, sons. So it's kind of like a collective question, I guess. But I'm a mother of a child with autism, and I'm always mindful of my other child, who is, you know, the one that's not a special girl, the one that's that can be so many times getting lost in the background. So my question to you as a sibling is what made you to decide to be leaders with advocacy or the sibling? And um, for the mom, how would you manage that and support that and your children? And then for the mom, how does that make you feel that your siblings are happy and the sibling to support? I have the mic, so I'll go first. Um, for me, it was just innate. No one asked me to step up or they help out. Um, I just wanted to do it. It was, it, it, I, I just naturally took on that role. Um, but I, I really don't know where it started and how it kind of snowballed from there and turned into what it turned into now. But I just, it was just always a part of it too to me, and it just developed from there. Um, but I think it's just part of being a family and having a supportive family. So I know that's something that my mom, my mom's always been like, I'm so bad, I feel guilty. You shouldn't be doing this. You should be the sister. And it's not, no one forced me to do this. I, I want to do it. I, if I didn't want to do it, I would set that boundary. So it has, I, I think that's important for parents to hear too. If there is a sibling that wants to set up, don't feel it's they're doing it out of guilt because they're quote unquote being forced to do it. It's it's there's probably something in them that makes them want to. And I think that's not something that's talked about enough. Um I do it because I know a lot of other students always feel like they got to be protector and all that we did with their students. But also I do it because I don't my students feel like they always going to do it by themselves and they just need shadows of the dark and there's no light. And so I always want to let my students know that I'm there for them and I can go through it with them together. For me, it wasn't too much advocating for them, like to my mother or whatever, because he he speaks for herself, you know, he's one of those that talks. But <laughs> So, but it was more so like, you know, with other people our age, they were like, why, why does he do this? Why do you know that? That's kind of weird, you know, stuff like that. And I'm like, well, you know, he has autism and that could probably be the reason why. And they'd be like, oh, that kind of makes sense. And then sometimes they start asking follow-up questions, but within a household, he kind of had, had a case for himself. Um, well, for me, um, I kind of like that they step in and, and whatever. So, like I mentioned, they have genetic conditions. Like, we started off at the beginning. Roshan was the child we were always at the hospital for. So, you know, it was like focus on him, and the elements were kind of visible for those first few years. And then it focus shifted to him. Then we had COVID come when my son turned 18, my oldest son turned 18, and they pretty much turned invisible and the focus shifted on him because he became sick and in the hospital and all that. So, you know, each one of them had their turn and they had to step up and be the advocate for each other. And you know, they got a good practice because they got to see how it's advocating and advocating for other families. So it's kind of ingrained in them, which is what we do. Okay, I think it works. First of all, thank you everybody. This has been so nice to hear your stories. So thank you for being so generous with that. I guess for those of you that hold your other family hat, professional hat, maybe you're a researcher, a clinician, you can answer this in different ways, but what are some specific examples of ways you've changed your practice maybe as a researcher or clinician? And then the second one is, do you ever think it's harder that you sort of see both sides of it? 
I would think all of them think, oh, we we'll see things right. We we'll oversee it. It, it, it is a way to call it. But anyway, two questions there. But just curious your thoughts on it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as you know, we're both on a study. One of our big studies right now involves um, working directly with families who have children that are newly diagnosed. Either through the study or through um, who've been referred following a diagnosis, you know, waiting for intervention. And so, working with families who that such in such new information, they have a lot of questions. You know, they're they're facing all kinds of things that they're trying to set up and, and all of that. Um, and so, I definitely think, though I had worked with families in that situation before, that I can do that with like empathy. You know, just just understanding what that feels like a little bit more now. Um, and I would say that, you know, from, I know it sounds kind of cliche, but I really mean it, um, from all the families that I did work with, for my children weren't even diagnosed, like, I took so much that I learned from them, you know, in my journey, and that was really, really helpful, but I would say that that has changed, like, I, I feel like that was empathetic, and, you know, like, connecting with families with that it just helped me connect at a deeper level. Um, so, I, I think it's a good thing. <laughs> I definitely think it's a good thing. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of how to answer this. So, I'm going to just be very transparent. Um, always having anxiety, always overthought things, you know, again, and, and, and it's all ADHD diagnosis. So, again, um, and then the interesting part is that. I will say that there was some, you know, from a personal standpoint, really intense mom guilt, um, really intense of knowing what I know as a professional, and then microcosms of, you know, all of all of the lists that go everywhere, tangential. I shouldn't have taken my time with them all. What if I had this exposure? Um, I had too much stress because I was working in the ER and moving, going through all of the things. Um, I will say it as a clinician, as a medical director, that's probably, um, because I am such an open book, uh, you know, I'm in practice too, um, a lot of me to be more insightful and really share with others that, and I don't want to say to normalize that, but to, you know, to normalize it to a degree and also in that open bookness to make sure people know it's okay to get help and it's also okay to do therapy and very open book about that probably done therapy seven distinct times in 20 plus years um and i think that's what i'm in med school because it's really intense and test anxiety um and so i think being able to share that perspective of it's okay to get yourself help it's also okay to embrace the guilt and let it go right because we can all say to someone didn't do that. If you didn't cause that, that's just going to make someone ninety percent of the time more anxious, you know. Again, and for um, someone to trust you because they think that you're not legitimizing your feelings, right? Um, and so I think allowing myself to be vulnerable, like Jessica mentioned, and share is hopefully, um, you know, at least what people have told me, you know, again, made that be a more real journey for them and made them feel more comfortable with where they're sitting. Um, the perspective that I don't have is I'm not a dad and I'm not a guy. And so, um, I, you know, again, I think that I want to mention that because I feel like that is an incredibly important perspective that sometimes gets lost in the shuffle. We're really, we're really lucky in Ohio to have some really, um, at least I think, you know, for a person, so for people that are very steeping off, they're very vulnerable in sharing their emotions, very vulnerable in sharing their stories as dads um, of children with um, different needs or medical complexities. And I don't think those voices are always heard. So that's the part that I think I'm talking, but I can't change that because I'm, again, um, a mom and a female. You know, so, um, so hopefully, it gives you a little bit of perspective. I think it's just hopefully, maybe about the clinician. I want to feel like I'm always, you know, the hearing person, like Jessica said, but I think it's hopefully providing some perspective and also, um, again, allow others to realize it's okay to get help. Yeah.
Let's thank our panelists one more time for a terrific panel. Thank <laughs> you.